Here's what's coming up on today's show. So at the end of the day, you know, yes, politics have a lot to do with it, but most of it is going to be the economy. So how are we going to do? It's going to be an interesting next four and a half years. I'll put it to you that way. Welcome to the How Money Works podcast with Craig and Jennifer Moser of Maestro Wealth Advisors, serving you throughout the triad of North Carolina for more than 30 years. Let's talk about some current financial trends, guys, because, uh, you know, this is the end of, uh, well, we're right here around Labor Day, right? Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, August was uh, interesting, right? A little volatility happened in there in the month of August. So let's talk, let's start there. (laughs) Well, it's kind of crazy, you know. I will give you this. Here's a, the first of a few statistics. Very boring stuff. So this isn't a Moserism. This is real <laughs> these statistics. Are, these are statistics. Okay. As of 8-26-24, the Dow Jones Industrial Average closed at an all-time high ever, ever, ever. Now, I can remember in the 90s when it crossed 10,000. Okay. And we were like, oh, it'll never hold this. Yeah. Well, it closed at 41,240 on the Dow Jones. That's the... 30 stocks, the largest bulls in the pen, if you will, yep. big companies. And guess who are the leader, leaders this year so far? Energy and consumer staples hmm. instead of tech and consumer discretionary, at least right now. Interesting. Right now for this month. Right. So it's, it's kind of crazy. You know, tech's usually the standout leader, mm-hmm. but, you know, for uh, August, not so much. You know, when I look at this, I got to tell you, I read these, uh, we get a lot of research. So City, C-I-T-I, has a panic slash euphoria model that they they send out to us once a month. And guess what? No surprise. Currently, we're in the upper ranges of euphoria. In 1999, if you were an investor then, see, I was. I, 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 was, I was in this industry in 99, okay. and it was quite euphoric. It was very difficult to talk to people about anything other than the hot dot. And so (laughs) things happened after that. And it wasn't very good for the next decade. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but my little beeper's going off. You know, when you look at right now and look at bond prices, Mm -hmm. they're starting to rise. Now, understand why that happens. If you issued a bond this year and it pays 5%, And our Federal Reserve chairman comes in in the next month and a half or so and says, hey, guys, guess what? We are dropping rates a half of 1%. That bond doesn't drop its rates. So that means that the price will probably go up some in what a new person would have to pay if they bought that bond from you. Bond prices with an expectation of interest rate reductions typically increase. The other thing I'm seeing is if they're going to drop interest rates, think about that for a second. If they're going to drop interest rates, real estate has, has been respond. The way that it's said is responding positively to expectations of drop in interest rates. So yes, it's kind of the wild, wild West. If you're asking, you know, at the same time, when we hear all this employment numbers are beginning to soften some. So let's talk about what what the guy said the other day. You know, if you heard, they had revised our employment data. Yeah. Right, revised they it did. down. Yeah, quite they a went bit. down. Yeah, quite you a think, bit. Yeah. So let me give you quite a bit. It's the biggest revision since 2009. Uh, it was a markdown of 818,000 fewer jobs than previously reported in 2024. So think about that. Now, this was according to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, not Mm -hmm. Craig Moser. Right. So that's approximately 30% less people, you know, getting jobs than originally stated. That, That concerns me. So if you look at other things that are happening, for example, debt. When we look at the average household, there's some things that you're seeing there that not so good. I mean, I watch and I have the restaurant um, research. I go by on Friday night and see how many people. Oh, this are, is your personal research this is, looking at restaurants, that's, right? Yes. And sometimes I go in them too and eat. But <laughs> what I see is places are full. You cannot get a seat. And I'm like, golly, if things cost all this much more inflation and, you know, people are, are trying hard to keep up, how are they having the money for this? But then I, I, I get these statistics. Now, this is household debt. 
you know, when you looked at the years 2008 and 2009, debt was high leading up to those years. And then we had a substantial mortgage crash. That's basically what happened. Post-2009, consumers paid off record numbers of debts. They just said, I don't like the way this feels. I got strung out there. You know, maybe you lost your job and, you know, you had really to struggle during that period of time and people didn't like it. But you fast forward to 2024, there's a lot more consumer debt. So in 2024, more debt and less money to put in your own pocket because stuff costs a whole lot more than it used to. You know, according to the New York Federal Reserve Bank, Household debt is up 17.3 trillion with a T dollars. That means that, for example, credit cards, you know, revolving debt, auto loan, home equity lines, mortgages. When you look at those, you go, wow, they're very high. So what do I ask myself when that happens? Okay, if everybody's borrowing, are they paying their bills? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's talk about credit cards delinquencies. So 8.9% delinquency rate right now on credit cards. So that's Ooh, not good. 7.9% delinquency on auto loans. But the other side of that mortgages, there's not much delinquency. So that makes you feel a little better. I didn't get the, the average numbers on the home equity lines. I just mm -hmm. didn't have time to do it. But overall, about 3.2% delinquency rate on, on the household debt. Here's another debt, and, that, and this one floats. I don't really understand this one the way I should, but there's greater than $1.6 trillion in student loans. That's a lot. And almost half aren't paying, according to the New York Times. Now, that's the New York Times. I'm quoting my sources here, and the average student loan debt's about $37,000. So are some of these people um, waiting to see if they get it Forgiven. Written off, right? Yeah. Forgiven. Mm -hmm. or, or what, I don't know. But these are big numbers. I mean, these are numbers you can't ignore. So you've got to think about the good. Man, things are growing like crazy. You know, the stock market's up, and, and it looks like the bond market's doing good. And, and then I look at this debt number, and I think about inflation. Now, inflation bugs the snot out of me because you hear this stuff, and they say inflation's back down to 2.6%. And I'm like, okay. That's good, isn't it? That's their, their target number is 2%. And then I have to remember per year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yep. stuff went up in 2020. Stuff went up in 21. Stuff went up in 2022. And 23, that stuff's still up. It yep. didn't go back down. Mm -hmm. It just means that the pace of continually higher prices it slowed some. Yeah, we were just talking to really somebody the other day, Craig, and they were like, think about it this way. You know, if you gained 100 pounds over the course of a couple of years and then you lost five, you're still up 95 pounds, right? <laughs> you know, I was But like, here, even with inflation, you're not losing. You're continuing to grow. Right. But you're not, you're not growing at as fast of a clip. Right, yeah. exactly. Right. And that's hard so, for people to understand. Yeah, so when I look at all this stuff, I have mixed emotions about the market. So everybody's asking me, what about the presidential election and the stock market? I hear that a lot, you know, and I'm like, well, I, I don't know what's going to happen this year. It's a very divided country. And, mm -hmm. you know, you're either heavily on the left or heavily on the right. There's not much in the middle. I'm just telling you what I see as a obser observer in this thing. And so it, it makes me a little concerned about that part. But truly, not much really happens during an election. Usually there's a modest sort of increase the year of the election. And then depending on where the economy is, which is really the bottom line here, uh, that's really what pushes it out in the following years. There's some s subtle differences in the years, and there's some subtle differences in whether it's a red or blue president. But at the end of the day, not much happens unless there's something wrong economically. So look at, look at Barack Obama. <laughs> that was a wonderful economy to roll into. I mean, it wasn't. It was a terrible economy to inherit as a president. Mm -hmm. I will just tell you that was that was terrible because he was rolling into that mortgage crisis. You know, his guys had to, to, to figure out what to do about do we let the banks fail because there were a bunch of bank failures or do we bail them out and where does the money come from? And they printed it, a boatload of it. So at the end of the day, you know, yes, politics have a lot to do with it, but most of it is going to be the economy. So how are we going to do? It's going to be an interesting 
next four and a half years. I'll put it to you that way. So uh, I'm not really sure. I, I get asked the question all the time, so I enjoy at least pontificating about it a little <laughs> bit. But at the end of the day, you know, a lot of it doesn't depend on the politics. I look at corporations and and truly whether the left or the right gets in on on the presidency or not, McDonald's still makes hamburgers. Procter and Gamble still makes Pampers. I mean, I hope they make Pampers anyway. <laughs> but but anyway, um you, you see what I'm saying. And all they really want to know what the rule is 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 what the rules are from a uh, economic standpoint, how much do we have to pay in taxes? Are there new regulations? Right. And will you not change them for a while so we can adapt and in, in, in operate in and the prosper. system? prosper. Yeah. I mean, that's really all a corporation business owners need is for you not to change the rules on them, and they can figure out how to how to work in the system. So it's, it's, it's kind of fascinating to me when people look at that. Thank you so much for checking out the podcast today. If you have any questions about what we've discussed, remember, you can get a complimentary financial review with the team at Maestro Wealth Advisors by calling 336-448-1086 or go online to howmoneyworksradio.com for other great resources and ways to reach the team. You can also check the show notes of today's episode for our contact information as well. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite app so you never miss an episode. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and all the most popular apps. For Craig and Jennifer Moser, I'm Mark Killian. We'll talk to you next time on the How Money Works podcast. Craig Moser is a financial advisor and certified financial planner. Securities offered through Avantax Investment Services, member FINRA SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Avantax Advisory Services. Insurance services offered through Avantax Affiliated Insurance Agency.